day on the Sabbath. It's kind of <laughs> kind of overcast and cloudy out there, but at least it is not in the single digits. Ooh, that was cold. <laughs> My message today is titled, Or, <laughs> with a subtitle of Choices. Well, like they used to do on PBS, I believe it was, may still do it. But this message brought to you by the word, Or. Yes, that tiny little word that tells you what, <laughs> what your choices are. It could be as simple as what you want want for dessert, like cake or pie. For instance, let's say that now that one of those is a peanut butter pie and you're allergic to peanuts, that choice just became more important, didn't it? <laughs> well... That one's not too important. Uh, let's see. Pardon me, I'm kind of losing my place here. How about if you're deciding between pork chops or lamb chops for your entree? Well, if you're of the world, just your average guy or gal out there, then it's not that big a choice other than that the lamb is going to be way more expensive. But if you are a Christian you have entered into covenant with God, then that choice, that or, is quite a bit more important because you are choosing to obey or to disobey, a.k.a. sin. That is, everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness, which is 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. That is just one example of many. Just as keeping Jesus' Sabbath holy or venerating Sunday as the Catholic Church and most other religions tell you, to, tell you to. If you're of the world, now then, for you, it doesn't really matter at that, at that moment, but if you've taken his name, if you call yourself a Christian, and you've taken his payment for your sins, then... It is uh, imperative that you keep his Sabbath. First thing, <coughs> let's go to First uh, First Corinthians, chapter six, verses nineteen and twenty. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own; you were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. And then, quick trip over to 1 Peter. Chapter 1, verses 13 through 19. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, let your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming as obedient children do not conform to the evil desires that you had when you lived in ignorance but just as he who called you is holy so be holy in all you do for it is written be holy because I am holy since you call on a father who judges every person's work impartially live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear for you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Jesus did so much, and frankly still does so very much for us. How many times noticed or maybe you just magooed your way on through on through it completely unnoticed has Jesus quite literally saved your life maybe it was a red light that ran ran too long putting you behind behind by a light from where you should have been but where you thought you should have been a drunk was running that red light 
or maybe here in Jackson, it was just a texting driver. And you get T-boned. Or your alarm clock doesn't wake you, and maybe you sleep half through the work day, but end up finding out there was a shooter situation when you, when you call them to tell, tell, to tell them why you weren't there. And, of course, they could be far more blatant than that. It could be a literal, literal turn, turning back of time, or you could be, could be, st- be standing there and be practically point blank with a shooter, and they miss. <laughs> I'd call all of the, all of those a great miracle. Any of them. But it's not only your right now life that he has provided for. Jesus has a place to take those who love him. And just so you don't have to wonder, as he, as he did with the question of what is sin, he also defined clearly what it is to love, him, love himself and the Father. Let's go over to John, chapter 14, 15 through 26. Straight up at the beginning here. If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and to be with you forever, the Spirit of Truth. The world cannot accept him, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long the world will not see me any more, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them and will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Now there were several parables that have examples of or in them, ors in them, uh, the sheep or the goats, the wheat or the tares, any of them really that compared two things or where someone, someone chose to do what is wrong instead of obeying God. The funny, strange, maybe even ironic thing about the choices of our oars we are presented is that even the things that look like they are going to be more, more enjoyable, more profitable, or even seem the safer option. If those options violate God's law, then not only do they often, in the long term, not work out like you thought, but you often feel, frankly, like dog crap afterward. Not that that feeling is a bad thing. It's your conscience and the Holy Spirit teaming up on you to get, get you to get you to go to Jesus and to admit it and to repent of it. Thank you, Jesus, for your faithfulness to forgive whatever we confess to you. There are a lot that will tell you that it's too difficult to do what God said to do in the law. Oh, and by the way, I use the word God there, but that that being that gave the law to Moses, to the children of Israel... And he is the same one that is known by the name Jesus today. 
If you have any doubts about uh, about that, reread the first chapter of John. Jesus said to the children of Israel, well, let's just go back and read it. Deuteronomy chapter 30. Eleven through sixteen. Now what I am commanding you today is not too difficult for you or beyond your reach. It is not up in heaven so that you have to ask who will ascend into heaven to get it and proclaim it to us so we may obey it. Nor is it beyond the sea so that you have to go and ask who will cross the sea to get it and proclaim it to us so we may obey it. No, the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart, so you may obey it. See, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him and to keep his commands, decrees and laws. Then you will live and increase, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to possess. And back up into the New Testament to Matthew chapter 11 28 through 30 come to me all you who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest take my yoke upon you and learn from me For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden light. Jesus did not say, I'm throwing off your yoke and taking your burden away. The Sabbath. What is so hard about taking that day off from all of your work? Not going to your job to earn money. No side hustle, whatever that is. No working around the house, including including, but not limited to laundry. Now, let's say say you're eating something. It gets on your clothes. That's going to stain badly. But you could take it and pre-treat it so it doesn't stain. Perfectly fine. Just no doing laundry for later in the week. That can wait till Sunday. mowing the lawn and lawn work, cleaning up the house, cooking for the rest of the week. By the way, perfectly fine to clean, to cook for a Sabbath meal. Just don't go preparing, you know, eight pieces of chicken for the next, eh, next week and a half or something. Basically, if it's something you could have done during the week that you can still do after Sabbath, it can wait. The idea is to clear the decks so you can spend time with your God, Jesus. Now, if you're not in covenant with God, then all of this seems rather stupid and foolish. But, let's go to Psalms. One eleven. Beginning in verse 1. Praise the Lord. I will exalt the Lord with all my heart in the counsel of the upright and in the assembly. Great are the works of the Lord. They are pondered by by all who delight in them. Glorious and majestic are his deeds and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. He has shown his people the power of his works, giving them the lands of other nations. The works of his hand are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever, enacted in faithfulness and uprightness. He provided redemption for his people. 
he ordained his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his precepts have good understanding. To him belongs eternal praise. Now, the fear of the Lord is the Jewish term, what they use for the <laughs> for four, essentially four precepts. Sabbath observance, holy day observance, tithing, and dietary laws. If you do those, you fear the Lord. And, let's see, up to Proverbs. Chapter 1. And as usual, I went too far. Chapter 1, verses 2 through 7. I'll just start at verse 1. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, for gaining wisdom and instruction, for understanding words of insight, for receiving instruction in prudent behavior, doing what is right and just and fair, for giving prudence to those who are simple, knowledge and discretion to the young. Let the wise listen and all their learning and, and add to their learning, and let the discerning get guidance for understanding proverbs and parables, the sayings and riddles of the wise. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. And back up to 1 Corinthians. Chapter 2, 6 through 16. <coughs> we do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we declare God's wisdom a mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our, for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. These are the things God has revealed to us by his Spirit, the Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. What we have received is not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught to us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual realities with spiritually, spiritual taught words. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness, and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. The person with the Spirit makes judgments about all things, but such a person is not subject to merely human judgments. For who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Now those not in covenant are not seeking to come into covenant. It's simply not, eh, not their time. We have to look for those that will be saved. And I'm not talking, talking about God making a list of those he wants and those he doesn't. But he does know who is willing and who is not. And those that could be willing and how far that he has to push them to bring out that willingness. But remember, if he is trying you, then it is because he sees something worth purifying. Jesus wants to see what you choose to do with what you know. 
For example, you find out about the Sabbath. Do you say it's going to be too hard or be an inconvenience? Or do you take steps to get the Sabbath off of work? See, that was an or. You could do it or not. A choice. Let's say next time he hits you, he hits you with the dietary laws. Now that hits on two fronts. Not only can you have your fa- can you not have your favorite pork barbecue sandwich anymore, but even the cheapest other option, generally chicken, is more expensive. So again, you're having to make a choice. Then tithing gets thrown in there. And it's not just for the first tithe to the church, but also the second tithe that you save for the holy days. At this, you're thinking, whoa, 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 wait a second, stop right there, hold the presses, back up the truck. Two tithes? And more times I got to take off? Here, well, if you're single, then it's where... I, where I'm going going to get you're thinking where am I going to get the money for that and I just told her told my boss I'm not working Saturday anymore and now I got to go in and tell her tell him other times I can't work if you're married it's probably more along the lines of oh my husband or wife is going to love this one but It's all about choices. Jesus wants to know if you love him, how much you love him, and do you put anyone or anything before him? That list includes hobbies, habits, vices, jobs, money, stuff, possessions, etc., friends, or even family. If any of these things can come between you and Jesus, that means obeying him, even under duress, if any of these things can can come between you, well, he's got to know. Frankly, you need to know too what you got in you. Now, thank God, Jesus is exceedingly patient, but. If you want him to stick around, he's going to get what he wants. So there is the quick, maybe slightly painful way, kind of like tearing off a Band-Aid. Or you can dig in your heels, shake your head, even ball up your fists. But I wouldn't suggest it. Because at that point, either he gets his way, or you're going to be in for a very hard time. Let's go to Second Peter. Chapter 3, 8 through 10. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the, Lord, with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. He's not looking, not looking to mess up your life. He's not looking to punish you. In fact, he'd like, he'd, like, he'd like to have you just come clean with him so he can let it go. Well, the long and the short of it is, if you are saved, that is, the, that, is that Jesus has forgiven your sins and you have come into covenant. Let's go to Ephesians. Chapter 2, verse 
verse 11 to 22. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by setting aside in his flesh the law with its command and regulations. Now here he's not talking about setting aside God's law. It's the law of sin and death that he's setting aside because of your belief and coming into covenant with him. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people, and also members of his household. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstones. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord, and in him you are being built together being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. It's this that makes this so important. That we are, or should be, <laughs> the new creation. Go to Second Corinthians. If I can go the right way, I'll get there a lot faster. Hey. That's Second Corinthians chapter five, seventeen through twenty one. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God has reconcil was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, as he has committed, us the, to, the, committed to us the message of re reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had, sin, had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And into the next chapter, just a verse or two. As God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, In the time of my favor I heard you, and in the day of salvation I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. And up to Galatians chapter 6. Verse 15. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is the new creation. Small verse, but there's a lot there. If you are this new creation, it is the most important thing you could ever do 
to be obedient an obedient son or daughter of God. These tests, trials, choices, <laughs> oars are refining and producing the character of our Father in heaven and Jesus our Lord in us.